Welcome to the next episode of our podcast on negotiation. And today we have a very special guest, Giuseppe Conti, who has taught negotiation probably at every single business school from the top 10, from the Business Week's top 10, uh, who has taught um, to many executives across uh, the continents, uh, who has uh, trained master classes in negotiation. Giuseppe, uh, great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Remy. My pleasure. Did I forget anything, Giuseppe, in the introduction? Is there anything important that you would like to add? Well, maybe, you know, the one thing is indeed, you know, I've been teaching all over, but uh, maybe what makes my career a bit different is I've been working in the corporate world for 25 years. Now, of course, you know, if you say I've been teaching for 17 years and working for 25 years, that makes me too old. But uh, <laughs> actually, what I did, I did a portfolio career. For 13 years, I was working and, and, uh, and teaching at the same time. And since I was uh, an executive working in procurement, then I was negotiating, I was influencing, let's say, on a daily basis as part of my job. And that's what led me then to become a professor in negotiation and influencing. Yes, and a friend of mine, um, uh, Barney Jordan, uh, a professor at Vleric Business School in Belgium, he told me that there is an even English word for what we are, and we are pracademics. Uh, we are pracademics, uh, we are practitioners with an academic background or academics with practical background. And I think that's, uh, that's super relevant in the context of influencing and negotiation to be able to combine uh, what we know from, um, from the scientific context, from scientific research with... Uh, uh, with uh, with the experience that we bring to the table as practitioners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and today, uh, Giuseppe, today we're going to talk about how to influence internal stakeholders. So let's dissect the title of our talk and start with influencing. And so you are an influencing, uh, a professor of negotiation and influencing. What does it mean to influence others? Well, uh, when we say most of the people when think about influencing, they imagine, you know, being able to come up with uh, the most powerful sentences uh, or using uh, some of the tricks that they've seen on a YouTube video uh, to get people to do whatever they want. Uh, in my opinion, you know, influencing starts with uh, having uh, the right attitude toward your counterpart. So it's about, you know, focusing on the person that you're dealing with, try to understand as much as possible about them. So it's about asking questions. It's about listening. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, there is a terminology that says, you know, pull energy or push energy. And uh, it's very much about pull energy rather than push. Tell us a little bit more, please, uh, about pull and push energy. Yes, uh, when we think about uh, influencing, we typically think about push uh, mode, right? Uh, about us influencing another person, another object. Uh, um, but why does the pull energy appears in the context of influencing? Now, oh, we do need the both. Now, the push energy is more like persuading or even asserting. I need this no matter what. <laughs> While, you know, the pool energy is more about uh, uh, listening, um, asking questions, or uh, maybe giving a vision, uh, identifying common values. These are some of the elements that uh, will get the people, you know, to want to come with us on the journey. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, why am I saying that you need both? Because uh, there will be the appropriate context for the right tools. You know, for instance, if you have good data, maybe you're going to use persuading. You know, if you have facts and reason that are very strong, maybe you're going to go for persuading. Maybe if you need something, no matter what, then you will try to assert, uh, you know, what uh, is really important to you. But uh, sometimes, uh, especially if you want to bring your people along, on a long journey, then you want to focus more on the vision, on the common value, so that people are motivated to come with you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, you have a, a vague idea of what you need to do, but you want to build on the idea of the others, and that's where you need, you know, the questions and the active listening. Now, especially with internal stakeholders, the pool is so important. Now, you know, when you are negotiating with an external party, then 
you may be more on a push mode and we are all familiar you know with different kind of negotiation styles and uh, depending on the context of negotiation we may ended up using uh, the most appropriate style but uh, in the case of an internal influencing approach then uh, we may want to stay more with the pool energy it's very interesting Giuseppe when you uh, when when you defined uh, when you defined influencing and uh, pull and push uh, modes uh, that immediately immediately uh, caused um, an association in my mind with leadership yeah? um, um, because a previous concept or previous understanding of the concept of, uh, of the leadership was a leader influencing or uh, persuading others so exerting push energy right? more modern way of understanding the concept of leadership goes uh, more in the direction of of pulling them towards uh, a certain desired way of uh, uh, way of action is uh, is that how you would uh, what is the difference what are the similarities and differences between um, influencing and leadership now uh, let me quote uh, john maxwell which says uh, leadership is influencing not in more, not in less. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great now, answer. <laughs> no, so in that respect, you know, yes. So the, the, there are there are strong tank, t- type of things. Now, I think you know, leadership is much broader, right? You know, leadership involves uh, a number of other things that me we want to do. A- and if I may, you know, I'm stepping a bit away from uh, the influencing topic, but if I may we may have a tendency of, uh, in the current context of today, to focus too much on the uh, pulling people with us. So, okay, let's organize party. Let's give them flexible working hours. Let's make sure that the people uh, are well treated and uh, you know, whatever is going And then, you know, we may forgot, forget about also that there is a need to deliver results. And so uh, there is, a, you know, uh, some people, uh, you know, the old style was, okay, I want the result and I don't care about the people, you know, maybe I give them a big uh, check, you know, think about banking, you know, Lehman Brothers kind of style. It says, okay, listen, you know, I want you to work hard and, and deliver great result. And if you deliver, you get big money. But uh, then, you know, there is uh, the other type of leadership, which is more like, uh, okay, we want to make it nice, but no, I cannot give the such message because they may leave. Or uh, I, I know if I tell her that she didn't do this well, then she may not feel well, etc. So I guess, you know, the good leader should needs to be able to do both, right? You know, be in the yeah. quadrant where you're both focusing on the result, focusing on the people, and that's where you maximize uh, the performance and have happy people so we've talked about uh, we've talked about uh, leadership and influence uh, uh, the next chunk yeah the next uh, uh, words in our title uh, refer to internal stakeholders yeah? so let's uh, let's try to give our viewers and uh, and listeners a better feeling of what the di- what is the difference between negotiating with or influencing external stakeholders and those that are internal, st- uh, internal to, I assume, our organization, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there are a multitude of differences. Uh, and uh, uh, let me mention a few, few. You know, first of all, you know, when you try to influence an internal stakeholder, it's not a one-off event that you're going to meet this person and the next time you're going to meet them is one year, right? You know, with an external party these people will be around in the cafeteria and there will be a number of other interaction which have different kind of uh, things to do. Uh, for instance, uh, going back to my times uh, as, a, as a procurement director, right? Let's imagine that you're doing something in uh, the HR category and you want to work with the HR director, but that same person is the same one that is going to approve your, your salary increases. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, you know, it's not quite the same thing, right? You know, that uh, negotiating with uh, an external third party. But uh, there are also a number of things that we do differently when we interact of, with uh, internal people. For instance, we may not prepare as well. 
right? You know, maybe because of the external meeting, there is money involved, etc. And we heard so many times, you know, preparation is 90% of your success. Still, many people don't do it. You know, we both know that there is still a lot of room in that respect. But, you know, many people told us. But preparing for an internal meeting is something that we may not do. Not uh, to the same extent. Or uh, we may not formalize what we discuss or agreed. We may not have a meeting report or those kind of things that may be more common in the external in the external world. And other things that is different, probably, you know, if we talk in negotiation terminology, and uh, I'm sure that in our audience there are a number of people that uh, follow the Center for International Negotiation and they're passionate about negotiation. Now, the button you may have a weak button when you're negotiating with internal stakeholders because you're not going to say, okay, listen, I'm not going to work with you. I'm going to work with somebody else. Uh, oh, well, okay. You may escalate to management. Uh, for some things you may outsource, but, you know, this is uh, the kind of things that you're going to do being extremely cautious, right? Um, maybe uh, let again, you know, building on my procurement experience, when a buyer, a seller, a buyer wants to buy and a seller wants to sell. But an external stakeholder, internal stakeholder, may not necessarily want to work with you. I remember, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, in the early times, you know, um, I started working in procurement in 1994. So, you know, that's uh, 30 years ago. And uh, uh, procurement didn't have uh, always uh, a very good brand. Right, you know, many people wanted to avoid working with procurement. So when uh, you wanted to say, go to the internal stakeholder and get them to want to work with you, uh, you may not have many people that really wanted to do business with you. So, you know, there are a variety of things, but also to conclude maybe in terms of approach, it's particularly important to have a win-win attitude. Because as there is this continuity of the relationship, then uh, you don't want to push your internal stakeholder and get them, you know, twist their arms to do the project with you. But you want to make sure that they really are committed and that, you know, the different functions can work effectively together. That's a great summary. So um, if, I, if, I, if I may pick on, uh, pick on the bits and pieces that resonated with me in particular, uh, Giuseppe, um, so first of all, there is future. So re repetitive, uh, uh, repetitive long-term or longer-term re relationship. Second, BATNA might be weaker, yes, uh, uh, because you know escalation is unpleasant, and uh, and other other alternatives might be might be too costly. Um, so and the, uh, number three, the goal is to win both or all of us. Yeah. So that, that, which means the setting, the setting that we um, that we that we have to face is radical. Well, maybe not radically different, but it's very specific for uh, for internal uh, for, yeah. for 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 organizations. So, so, what do we, Giuseppe? Before we move on to the next question, what do we need to do in addition to the things that you mentioned? You know, listen to each other, show empathy. What is the what else do we need to do to? Uh, influence internal stakeholder, stakeholders positively towards a one win-win outcome? I think, you know, show an interest for the person you're interacting with, right? So uh, if you want them, uh, remember, you know, the, the old saying from uh, uh, Stephen Covey, one of my favorite authors, if you have not read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, then I encourage you to read it because uh, is one of the books that shape my way of thinking. And, uh, you know, so seek first to understand and then to be understood is one of the things, right? You know, yes. uh, have the right soft skills, you know, the emotional intelligence that helps you to connect with the other people. Uh, too often, you know, we go and say, listen, I have my, my own agenda and I want to try to get you to buy my own agenda. And mm -hmm. I, I made the mistake so many times, you know, I mean, I'm now teaching it, but of course, you know, before I learned those things, I, I made the mistake so many times. How often I went to an internal stakeholder and uh, talked, listen, let's do this project because we're going to make a big cost saving. That was my agenda, mm -hmm. the cost saving. 
But uh, you see, if you want to get an internal stakeholder to want to work with you, maybe there are other kind of levers that you want to focus on. Maybe how the new stakeholder will bring uh, better service, better quality, sustainability, risk mitigation, innovation, uh, creativity, right? You know, think about your counterpart and see, okay, am I dealing with a marketing person? What's to resonate with them? Am I dealing with an R&D person? What will resonate with them? That's, uh, you know, the kind of mindset that we want to develop. Okay. Yes, that sounds, uh, that sounds, uh, sounds relatively straightforward. But we still know, right, as pre-academics, uh, we still know that there are demanding people in every organization who simply say no. <laughs> Yes, uh, despite the amount of the, the, any amount of empathy that we want to, uh, we, we might want to show and uh, active listening and you know addressing their interests. What? How do we? What do we do with these people? How? How can we still positively influence them? Okay. Well, uh, uh, yes. You know, there are a few things that come back to my mind. Right? You know, demanding stakeholders. You know, that they want you to do the work in half of the time, or that. Uh, they are expecting uh, something, you know, that the, the price decreases by 10% when the market is going up 30% or whatever. But uh, I think, you know, the first thing is, again, starting to understand why the person is demanding. It is their personality. And, and by the way, I will, uh, I will warn our listener to be careful with labeling uh, the people you're interacting with. You know, I've done it many times, the same mistake. Oh, he's stubborn. Oh, he's demanding. Oh, he's uh, realistic. Oh, he's uh, whatever. But, you know, yeah, of course, you know, there are people that, you know, they have some traits of personality that are this, but of course, you know, try as much as possible to be there to, to try to understand before making a judgment. Maybe there is a problem they are demanding because there is a problem of track record. It may well be that your function never delivers or maybe you never deliver. So then, then they ask you to have the information beforehand because they know, okay, if I ask by Friday, he's not gonna give it to me. So let me ask it by Wednesday so that they have a couple of days, you know, to, to things. Maybe you don't know well enough. And, you know, there is lack of credibility. You didn't build enough trust. So in that context, you know, they're being cautious and they prefer, you know, to be over demanding but sometimes, you know, there is a real business need. Yeah. You know, uh, looking back uh, at my uh, experience in pharma, you know, I worked with a couple of leading pharma companies, Novartis and Merck, and uh, sometimes, you know, when you're launching a new product, then you are in competition with another company and being the first on the market can make a huge difference to the kind of uh, business opportunity which is there. So there may be uh, a real business need to be extremely fast. But in those kind of situation, outline the consequences of this request. Okay, if rather than doing this in six months, we do it in three months, then this involves X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So that everyone is clear that uh, Okay, making this decision has also some consequences. Okay, mm -hmm. sure, the line may be poor quality or whatever, you know, something of this level that enable us to yeah. at least, you know, set a clear basis for the future of the collaboration. Yes. So with uh, my demanding colleagues uh, from the past, I remember uh, one, of, uh, one, one, one tactic that uh, worked really well um, was to um, frame the decision setting as a joint problem as, uh, and pose it as a dilemma. So I have a, I have a dilemma and I need you, to, uh, I need you to help me solve it. And, so, and so, uh, I, I've, I've, I've noticed that this triggers, this triggers our natural int instincts to help. Yes. Is that also your experience, Giuseppe, with, uh, with this tactic sort of, uh, hey, help me out with this dilemma instead of exactly. I need you to do that? Absolutely. I will say that uh, in more general terms, asking for advice is a powerful influence technique. It is a, a way, you know, also a form of flattery because somehow, you know, when you ask for advice, then you're telling me, listen, I value your experience 
and that's something, etc. And then, you know, it gets the person into, as you're saying, in a problem solving mood rather than in a, okay, that's the way we should do it. So I fully agree. Yes. So now we've talked about, um, we've explained the title. Yes. So we know what we would be talking about. And you also kindly shared a couple of, uh, a couple of advice how to handle certain situations. Uh, but now uh, probably many of our, of our viewers and listeners are thinking, hmm, so what do I need to do? Uh, what do I need to do to become a better influencer, to become a more effective manager, uh, to um, get my partners to do what I want or need them to do? Giuseppe, what's your yeah. answer to this question? Well, uh, one of the framework that uh, I share with uh, my business customer with my students at MBA and executive MBA is uh, the 5P framework. The 5P framework, maybe let me briefly take you to now, you know, we could spend a day, you know, <laughs> going through each of the points. So, but this, you know, just as a bullet points. So the first element, the first P is about profile the stakeholder, which is about understanding the person that you're dealing with, doing enough research. If you don't know them well, you know, maybe check their LinkedIn profile. Uh, then uh, you may talk with somebody that knows them. Uh, maybe they have an intranet website, uh, something on the intranet that gives you some more insight about uh, the priority of that kind of function and this kind of things. There are also tools uh, using artificial intelligence that let you understand uh, the personality of the person you're dealing with. You know, humantic.ai, for instance, is one of them. Crystalnose.com is another one where you go on LinkedIn, you click on this person, and you get, you know, the estimated personality profile. So this is, you know, the profile in the stakeholder. The second element is the preparation. Mm -hmm. The second element is the preparation. And on top of what we already know about negotiation and preparation for in negotiation that you probably already covered uh, in, uh, in other kind of episode of your podcast, then uh, in the internal, in, in, when we, you're trying to influence internal stakeholder, the element of stakeholder mapping is an important one. So, you know, try to classify the stakeholder and look at the interest, interest of each of the key stakeholders so that you have a better idea. The, the third element is about practice adult to adult relationship. So it's this idea of making sure that even if the stakeholder is a couple level more senior than you, you are able to establish, you know, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship rather than a top dog and underdog kind of situation. Then the, the fourth element is persuade them. And persuade them, of course, you know, there are uh, loads of persuasion uh, techniques uh, which are available out there. and. Uh, I think, you know, for instance, a classical one may be talk about what's in it for them rather than what's in it for you. Mm -hmm. Thank it, sounds you. Yeah. it sounds trivial, but then, you know, when I look at the people, you know, we talk about this, great. Then we do the role play and uh, during the role play, then people say, yeah, but for my company, this is important. You know, my, my boss asked me this, but, you know, for our, so, you know, we know that we should be talking about what's in it for them, but then we default to talking about what's ourselves, our company, our department, etc., etc. I conclude, and the fifth element that I have in my framework is about preserve the relationship. So don't only go to the stakeholders when you need them, but have a keep in touch strategy. Make sure that you are available where they need help, so that you know you are uh, a friend for good and bad times. You're not just uh, going to the internal stakeholder when you need them and then forget them for two years and then go back. Hello, do you remember me? It's that kind of things. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for, for this inspiring framework. Um, uh, happy, happy to share it with our audience, uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, in uh, one of the points, uh, Giuseppe, you touched upon adult to adult relationship yes i picked it up uh, picked it up carefully um i would like to understand it a little bit better right so this is this is what you call um uh, probably this is this is this, this is a call for nivelating uh, differences in in hierarchy is that what it's meant under adult to adult or is yeah. it uh, you mean more uh, recognition as a person 
Now, uh, let me explain it with an example, right? Uh, it was uh, 2005. I had recently joined a company as procurement director for Europe. And uh, one of the jobs that my boss gave me, there is, listen, there is this uh, large business unit that is not collaborating with procurement. I want you to go and get them to start working with us. So I went and uh, meet uh, the head of the business unit. I was a director. He was a senior vice president. I had been with the company only a few months. He had been with the company for over 15 years. Very much respected. All this extremely elegant. His name was Michel. I went to meet Michel. I went to meet Michel and I wanted to show a positive and proactive attitude to show to give an image of procurement as a function that was not what they were thinking, you know, about, you know, limitation. You can do this, you can do that, etc. So I said, listen, you know, we can analyze this. I can do this. Let me check. And do so I left this meeting with Michel. All the action were on me. Nothing on his side. And, uh, you know, whenever I was doing something, he would raise the bar and nothing really was really happening concretely in terms of the collaboration. So, you know, as I reflected, you know, clearly was not an example of me being able to establish uh, an adult to adult relationship with Michelle. So, as I reflected on this situation and tried to think about what are the kind of things that I learned from this, then, uh, you know, maybe let me share a few things that uh, will come to my mind uh, uh, on that experience. I think, you know, something that uh, you want to do when you're meeting someone, start with a personal introduction, right? Don't go immediately into business, but take a moment to connect at a human level. Uh, and uh, as you ask questions, as you listen actively, and as you get to know more about each other, then you may discover that you, you both worked at the same company before, or that you studied at the same university, that you support the same football team, that you both have three daughters or whatever. And this, you know, is a good way to create this bonding that gets the thing started. By the way, another thing that you want to do, you know, in this effort of establishing the right relationship, at the first meeting that you have, do not bring anybody else. It's important that, you know, the research suggests that it's easier to build the trust on a one-to-one -one basis than when you are a team-to-team -team kind of relation. So, you know, one-to-one, -one, do not bring a presentation. You know, it's not about, you know, presentation and both watching a screen. It's about a human interaction between two persons. And let me share a few other tips, you know, that uh, link to this first experience with Michelle. Another thing that I suggest to do, and it comes from uh, also from uh, my example before, make sure that there are action for both parties in the meetings. Because when there are action for both parties, it's also an opportunity, you know, to judge each other. Now, most of the time, you know, to a very senior guy, you're likely to uh, judge them in a positive way. But uh, it's also, it creates the basis for incremental request. We have done a first piece of work. Now let's do the second. Let's do the third. Right? You know, when you're meeting a senior stakeholder, it's unlikely that you're going to go and say, okay, let me tell you, I want to this, 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 this from you. But you start in, uh, uh, with one thing and then you move forward with other things. By the way, as you meet this person, something that you want to avoid in the future meetings is go to their office. You know, don't do like me with Michelle. I went into his office. The secretary was there. She kept me waiting. Then I went in. Michelle had the big desk and the big chair. I was on the small chair on the opposite side. Immediately, you know, create, you know, this uh, uh, top dog, under dog kind of things. But if you meet your internal stakeholder at the cafeteria, if you meet them for lunch, uh, or if you meet them in a virtual meeting, if they are in a different kind of location, then, you know, this hierarchy difference tends to disappear 
and makes the communication easier. I've been talking too much, but uh, okay. <laughs> Just uh, Giuseppe, wanted to share you know, some real life story. There is never enough uh, of wisdom, yes, words of wisdom. So let me let me express my appreciation. Join Maria. Uh, Maria, by the way, um, uh, hope you're do doing well. Uh, great tips. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Giuseppe, I know you are also, um, uh, you are a professor of influencing. Yes, uh, and you give classes, you give master classes. So if someone wanted to uh, wanted to learn from you as an influencing master, what do they need to do? Okay, well, first uh, one thing, there is one event that uh, is close to my heart and we just launched it this week. And that's the strategic negotiations masterclass. So I do have a workshop that is going to take place the 27 and 28th of June in Geneva. And uh, there are uh, two professors that are running it, Owen Derbyshire, which is the academic director of the Oxford Program on Negotiation, and myself. So uh, Owen is more uh, a traditional academic. I am more a pre-academic. So, you know, more of a tradition. And then, you know, we complement each other. So maybe we can put uh, on the chat the link about uh, the, the masterclass. So if, if somebody is interested, etc. Then, you know, I do workshop for corporate customers in uh, uh, you know, last year again, I've been teaching in four different continents. So I've been, uh, I had uh, people from 145 countries. You know, the last count is probably a bit more, but the last count is 145 different countries. So, you know, I am very often around and I'm running workshops, both virtual, virtual and physical, for a number of multinationals. So, you know, do not hesitate to connect on LinkedIn, by the way, maybe something that. Uh, uh, let me quickly put it uh, on the chat, but uh, if you're interested to connect, then you find me on LinkedIn and uh, it's very easy. Giuseppe Conti, yeah, let's do this. So, you know, that's, uh, and I share a lot of content for free on LinkedIn. So, you know, you cannot afford the masterclass. By the way, I forgot to say, we are launching the masterclass this week. So it's 40% off but only until the 18th of July, the 18th of February. So just in case, you know, you're interested to sign up for the masterclass, do it quickly because then you're going to get 40% off. But, you know, if you have this and I have no money to spend, then just follow me on LinkedIn. I have new content every day. And then, you know, you can learn from my videos, from my articles or from my other kind of things. Giuseppe, I'm glad that you shared uh, that you've shared um, uh, these uh, uh, valuable pieces of advice, uh, and I'm sure our, um, our um, viewers and listeners uh, would be interested uh, to follow up, uh, follow you on, on LinkedIn, or uh, connect with you on LinkedIn, or join your master classes or any of your uh, future uh, future trainings on, be it on negotiation or influencing. My last question, Giuseppe, is always about great negotiators. Uh, so who comes to your mind? Uh, do Are we going to get Italian uh, Italian great negotiators? Or maybe if not Italian, then uh, who comes to your mind when you think about, uh, uh, about uh, great historical or contemporary negotiators? Yeah. Now, uh, by the way, the negotiators are not famous, right? You know, you, 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 there are not many people that uh, are famous as a negotiator. Now, the one that comes to my mind is Harry Kissinger. As Eric Kissinger, you know, I'm thinking about him. I think he's 99 or no, I think, you know, or maybe he turned around. He should be 99 or 100, you know, something like this. And at this age, he continues to write and he has an influence in what is happening in international politics. You know, that's unbelievable. And as a secretary of state in the U.S., he was involved, you know, in many important negotiations, you know, reconciling the relationship with the uh, USSR, uh, the relationship with China, Israel, you know, after the Kippur War in 1973. And uh, of probably the most important is the peace talk with Vietnam that also led them to win the Nobel Prize. Yes. So Henry Kissinger is uh, one that uh, comes to my mind. By the way, Jim Sebenius, uh, a professor at Harvard, wrote uh, uh, a nice book about him. So, you know, if you're interested to find out some more, then you may also enjoy that piece. 
Giuseppe, uh, that's a that, that, that's a great uh, great call right here uh, right here. Um, I remember when I uh, last year last summer when I spoke with Jess Salakus about uh, leadership and negotiation, and uh, that was exactly the moment when Henry Kissinger released his re most recent book. It's called The Leadership. That was a uh, uh, nomen omen exactly the topic of our chat, and it came out I think like a day or two days before uh, before we spoke. So he is still very active. Uh, he um, uh, still uh, has a great legacy in terms of achieving great negotiation results, uh, uh, but he's also actively sharing his knowledge and experience uh, uh, with us. And I also place a link to his um, most recent book, which is called, by the way, Leadership, uh, Six Studies in the World Strategy. I have not read it yet, but uh, um, I hope to uh, to have a co closer look at it uh, this uh, this summer. Giuseppe. I think you know it's a role model for both of us. If we can get oh, a yeah. page ninety-nine, if we can get a page ninety-nine to continue to be influential, to be able to contribute, to be able to share with the others, you know, that's uh, would be amazing, right? Yes, absolutely. And I wish to you, Remy, that you that uh, at page ninety-nine you will be still running your amazing uh, uh, negotiation competitions and uh, making people uh, happy with uh, as they strengthen their negotiation skills oh i wish yes let's 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 hope that your wishes come true uh, giuseppe thank you thank you so much uh, for sharing your words of wisdom on influencing internal stakeholder it was a delight grazie mille giuseppe uh, take care and until the next time on the podcast on negotiation thank you so much my pleasure thank you remy bye-bye keep in touch